For our 10th anniversary, I decided to treat my wife, Betsy, and I to do a bit of sailing off the coast of Mindanao. The Philippines has some of the most beautiful beaches in the world, and you really can't beat the cost of things. A pack of Marlboros here is less than $2, and you can live and eat like a king on a pittance. Not that I need to save money or anything. While most of the medical community looks down on us, plastic surgeons tend to do quite well, and my career has certainly been no exception. I'd had a lot of time for my hobbies and sailing. Well, if I love anything more than Betsy, it's sailing. Just don't tell her that. Also, fuck those other doctors. Why live like a king when I could live like an emperor? I love my job and I'm good at it. The podiatrists and pediatricians can respectfully suck it. And Betsy and I spent a few days staying in a local air-conditioned bungalow. You got the best of both worlds. Bamboo construction for that tropical castaway feel with cleverly concealed central air. We'd spent a little time sunbathing outside on our own private section of the beach, sipping pineapple martinis out of coconut shells, and waiting for our best friends, Jazz and Butch, to arrive. I'll tell you, this is the life. Jazz, whose real name was George, earned his nickname by his amazing affinity for the trumpet. Tall and skinny, with one of those half goatees that starts under the lip, but stops well below the chin. Don't ask me how it didn't make him look like a douchebag, but somehow, it just works on him. Jazz really loved that damn trumpet too. Most of the time, it was attached to him like an additional appendage. It made him look like a mosquito in silhouette. Eventually, you had to force him to put it away, as there was only so many times that a wah-wah sound whenever you tripped or spilled a drink was funny. Butch, his wife, earned her own nickname by brute force of personality. She didn't look like a man, although she could certainly drink like one. It didn't help that she smoked cigars either. After they arrived and met us at the bungalow, we all boarded the ship called the Serene Majesty. Our destination, an unnamed island that Jazz swore was one of the most beautiful places that he had ever seen. Her Majesty was a fine vessel indeed, not on the level with the local rentals. Oh no, I'd secured her services with a sizable down payment from a British expat who took my money well enough, but couldn't seem to stress enough that he was keeping the deposit if she came home with a single scratch. I could understand him a little, even if he was a prick. Expensive hardwood construction had shined up nice. Serene Majesty had a single wide sail to her and an interior cabin that boasted a fully loaded bar, a large and full refrigerator, and two twin beds on opposing sides of the cabin. If the weather got bad on us, and you never know when it's going to rain in the Philippines, we'd be just fine bunking out in the boat. This was going to be an anniversary to remember. Our last, in fact. We'd had smooth sailing for the most part. The sun was shining and Betsy and Butch were drinking in the atmosphere up top, while also drinking out their inhibitions. Betts was nursing a wine cooler and Butch was chomping on the cigar, pausing occasionally to belt down a shot of tequila between words in her diatribe about how we're all weak for not spending three days every week at the gym. Betts interrupted her, pointing and shouting. Look, we all got a view of something special. A swordfish gave us a shiny hello, needle snout ready to impale anything in his path, and silver scales a sparkle. The trouble wouldn't come until later in that evening, when most of us had retired to the cabin to relax a little. The only one on top and steering the serene was Jazz, also a sailing enthusiast, He'd gone full New Orleans on us. This, in part, was why the rest of us decided to drink a few rounds below. Butch had just poured out three tequila shots and raised her own to Betsy and I, saying, To my favorite friends. Wait, Jazz should get in on this. Jazz, she shouted, 
The trumpeting above suddenly stopped, followed by a hollow thud for some reason. I didn't like it. Jazz! Butch shouted loudly again. Before any of us could get to the stairs, there was the sound of footsteps coming down. They sounded heavy and wet, and it was obvious that it was more than one person. Within a space of three to four seconds, those footsteps, slow, squishy, and loud, turned into three sets of legs. Black and gray, almost gelatinous, locomotion set freaky jello molds. Chunks were missing from them in various places, and there were three sets. Three sets of legs. The sky had darkened a bit, and I think it had started raining outside. The cabin was only dimly lit in the first place, but we suddenly saw the rest of them well enough. A man with two women walking closely behind him entered the cabin, all three of them in various stages of decay. One of the women was blonde and missing the most of her bottom lip. Her lower teeth, completely exposed, were almost flawless and contrasted oddly with a full and perfect upper lip. The other woman was a brunette, with a gaping greenish socket where one of her eyes used to be. She was smoking a cigarette, and for some reason that upset me more than her tattered body and the seaweed clumps she trailed wetly behind her. The man, fat and bearded, was probably the worst. His intestines were dangling in front of him through the gash in his belly, framed in an open Hawaiian-style shirt. Some of the intestines had tiny fish attached, wriggling and worrying at the ends, as if to get the last bit before the oxygen took all the piss and vinegar out of them. Jazz couldn't make it, the man said, speaking as if he had a mouthful of marbles and mouthwash. The women behind him began laughing, small amounts of water spilling from their lips as they did so and splashing on the floor. You almost had a laugh when Butch screamed first. One year later, the airport in Deveo was nothing like I'd expected. When Mindy and I arrived, we weren't sure what to expect, but everything was definitely a little on the low-tech side. Announcements were made out constantly on the loudspeakers, advising people by name that it was the last call for their flights as we waited at the conveyor to pick up our luggage. Some of the bags on the belt were unconventional, to say the least. Parcels looking like trash bags wrapped in tape joined an assortment of suitcases and duffel bags. People were very chatty, but neither I or Mindy could understand them. After gathering our things, we exited the airport without much fuss. There was a number of ATM machines outside, so I took advantage, drawing out about 20,000 pesos. That's about $360 US, and it lasts a very, very long time here. We descended some stairs, managing our six bags between us, four of which were Mindy's. Why can't girls travel light anyway? And we waved at a cab that was parked and ready to go. Our destination? A cozy little beach bungalow that I'd rented for us. Mindy didn't know it yet, but our little vacation was pretty much just the cover. I'd hired a guy in advance who was going to take us to a small, unnamed island that I had heard about which was close to our resort. The word on the internet was that the place was pristine, almost always unoccupied and amazing. The perfect place to propose. As we left the airport and entered Deveo city proper, it was obvious we were in another world. Heavy exhaust from the other motors made the air a little toxic from time to time, forcing me to roll up the window and skip the fresh air in lieu of the mildly filtered air conditioning air. Some of the people we passed had face masks that covered their mouth, like banditos, in an effort to be proactive about their health. We passed the McDonald's and something called a Jollibee, which our driver, a smiling old Filipino, explained was the Philippines version of, well, McDonald's. And I guess everybody likes fast food no matter where you go. It's a comforting thought. We also saw a number of flea market style stores mixed with more and shinier modern ones, 
And in about a half an hour, we'd left the city proper and the scenery abruptly changed. There were great swaths of trees on the side of the highway, wide leaves from the banana trees, long, fern-like ones from the coconuts, which ranged in size from super short and kind of squat to insanely thin and waving in the wind tall. Those trees have round wedges cut out of their sides, spaced two to three feet apart, going right up to the top. The driver says that the locals whack those holes out with a machete so that you could climb straight up and get the goods. Along the highway we passed a couple of small rice farms as well, looking like small man-made marshes, and in one place that had a number of tiny V-shaped wooden shelters which chickens sat inside or roosted comfortably on top of. Mindy pointed out a dark-skinned man with a brightly colored cloth wrapped around the top of his head leading a caribou that was pulling a makeshift wagon loaded with wood. It had tiny horns, but the thing was enormous, and coffee black in color. Before we exited and came to a port with a ferry, a number of cars were in front of us, and it was a few minutes before we got to the booth. I'd gotten bored and was texting a friend of mine on Facebook, and when we got to the booth, Mindy who chosen to sit in the back and stretch out her legs, shouted at me. What does that mean? No, she has no idea. What the hell are you talking about and who's this woman anyway? Mindy crossed her arms and gave me a green-eyed glare. She was a redhead and had the temper to prove it, and we argued about my Facebook conversation for the entire 30-minute ferry trip. That all changed, however, when we arrived. The bungalows were a quick 10 minute drive once we got off the ferry, large and circular. They dotted the resort area and each had a gazebo type bamboo enclosure in front of them as well. It's where you could sit outside and drink and look at the beach. The roofs of both looked like a gnarly synergy of shingles and fresh giant leaves. The inside of our bungalow was cozy but kind of spartan, and a Filipina girl named Maria who couldn't have been more than four and a half feet tall, took us there and showed us the inside. She was extremely friendly. The people here have a mix of local and Spanish culture, and it pervades their physical features as well as their language. Maria wore her hair in a pert, no-nonsense ponytail. We hope that you like it here, she said. Her speech was friendly and sharply accented. Most of our guests find it quite cozy. There was a portable electric burner for cooking, she explained during our brief tour of the bungalow, and with some pots and dishes in the cabinet. We had a modest twin bed, with an antiquated phone on the table next to it, and a tiny bathroom off to the side. The toilet was a bit of a novelty, as you flushed it by taking a large dipper of water from a plastic trash can, which you then poured into the toilet after use. The bowl itself you had to squat over, rather than sit down on. And Mindy and I both found this amusing and just a little bit daunting. After demonstrating its use, Maria left us with the key. Oh, and we host a barbecue every night. It's included with the price of your stay, but you'll have to get drinks at the bar if you want anything besides RC Cola, she said. Sounds great, Mindy and I said at the same time coaxing us to both laugh and look a little sheepish. Well, we'll see you then, said Maria, her ponytail bouncing briefly as she stepped out the front door. Mindy immediately popped one of her suitcases, a gray number with two small wheels at the bottom, up on the bed and started unzipping it and unpacking it with gusto. I checked my pocket and the little box with the ring in it was safely still there. I palmed the box and placed it in the satchel where I keep my laptop. Just then, the phone beside the bed rang shrilly. I crossed by Mindy and picked it up. Ayo, said Maria, adding, That's one of the ways that we say hello here. Anyway, I just wanted to test your phone. You call us if you need anything. Yes, ma'am, I said. We'll call if we need anything. I hung up the phone and smiled at Mindy. Our host was just testing the phone. Uh-huh, I think she likes you. So, 
You feel like getting a little sun, Johnny boy? Mindy asked, peeling off her shirt. She was wearing a lacy green bra from Victoria's Secret that she quickly removed and replaced with a neon pink swimsuit top. Yeah, sounds like a plan, I answered, smiling. It's hard to say anything very witty when Mindy is half naked and within jumping range. I'm a lucky man. I changed into my own swimwear, light beige shorts and a white sleeveless t-shirt. I'm not muscular or anything. Those shirts just feel a lot cooler in the sun than the sleeved ones. Swapping out our sneakers for some flip-flops, we went outside. I figured we'd still at least have a half hour to enjoy the sun before my surprise was scheduled. My little gazebo-type building was very close to the beach. We saw a number of kids playing out there, laughing and splashing with adults in the shallow waters. The line of swimmers seemed to stop at a particular point where it appeared there was some sort of underwater barrier. Probably a good idea that so no one got drunk and got swept silently out to sea, I suppose. We got a couple of drinks from the bar, a Long Island iced tea for Mindy, and a Red Horse beer for myself. A local brew, apparently. It was cold and slightly bitter, just like I like it. As we sat on the benches flanking the sides of our little gazebo, Mindy looked over and asked me, So, are you going to tell me what the surprise is all about? You'll find out soon enough, I said looking down as if my eyes might leak the secret. Mindy moved to my side of the hut, sitting very close to me and put her hand lightly upon my leg. You know, I always have a way of making you talk, she said. She began trailing her fingers lightly across my shorts. I could feel her nails scratching at the fabric and my body beginning to respond. Um, hi there, came another voice, killing the mood and producing a feeling that was two parts gratitude and one very solid part of irritation. A man with long hair, sunglasses, and a mustache that looked like it would never quite be full was standing there in front of the hut. He was wearing a short-sleeved black shirt that couldn't be too comfortable in this heat. But he didn't seem to be sweating, not even a drop. He looked amused and slightly embarrassed. I hope I'm not too late. Are you two ready to go? He said. Surprise, I said to Mindy, then to the man. Felipe, we'll need a second to pack a few essentials. Can you give us like ten minutes? Sure thing, said the man. I'll grab a beer if you don't mind and wait right here. Okay, I said. But only one beer, you're driving after all. Felipe laughed. You're the boss, he said. Mindy gave me a brief and wicked grin, saying nothing as we went inside. Listen, just pack enough for an overnight stay. You won't need much, I said. For myself, I grabbed my laptop bag. I had a change of clothes inside, wrapped around my computer, and the ring, of course. Mindy loaded some clothes and a bottle of Bombay Sapphire Gin into a small, separate duffel bag that she'd packed for spontaneous outings. We followed Felipe to what looked like a small, half-sized truck with black rails on the sides and room in the cab for the three of us. We left the resort and drove to one of the many local docks where a boat was waiting. It was pretty basic, with a small cabin underneath and a large, dirty-looking sail. Felipe told us that we would go down in the cabin and take a nap if we'd like, that he'd wake us upon arrival. Mindy was having none of that though, and we joined Felipe up on top where we could enjoy the view. The sea itself was blue, just like you see in all the pictures. We had a good wind and made it to the island in a couple of hours, passing our time drinking gin and fish spotting. Felipe dropped anchor a bit off the island's coast and told us that we'd need to swim to shore, adding that he'd get our bags to the land completely safe and dry for us. He went down into the cabin and brought up our bags, tying them securely onto a small wooden raft with a rope attached for pulling. Mindy whooped and splashed into the sea with me right behind her and we started towards shore laughing, swimming, and pausing for occasional friendly splashes at one another. The island really was quite pristine. It was a bit rocky underwater when we got close enough to stand, 
so we had to slow our pace as we walked to the beach to avoid getting cut. Once we'd arrived, though, it was all worth it. The beach itself was stunning. White sand, mango, and coconut trees all around. It looked like you could walk from one end to the other in less than an hour, but that was fine. It was a little piece of paradise. Felipe got on shore a little bit behind us, pulling his raft onto the beach and unlashing our bags. There's a little hut that you two could stay the night in, just beyond these trees, he said, gesturing a bit to our left. If you get hungry, you should try some of the lanzones, he added, pointing to a particular tree with tiny yellowish-brown fruits growing on it. After he'd knocked a few down for us with a stick, we learned how to eat them, squeezing along the seam to reveal a white pulpy flesh on the inside that was very sweet. Or sour if you got one that wasn't ripe. Just one more thing before I give you folks a little alone time, he said pulling something out of his pocket and pushing it into his neck. It was a white collar. Felipe was, after all, a Catholic priest. Mindy's eyes grew wide and I fidgeted for a moment, pulling the box out of my satchel. Mindy Connolly, will you marry me? I asked, falling to one knee. Yes, 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 she shouted, jumping into my arms. Her legs locked around mine as she kissed me dizzy and we fell to the sand, laughing. Felipe married us on the spot, staying only long enough to show us to our hut. No toilet this time and the bed looked a bit worse for wear, but the sheets were fairly clean. Felipe showed it to us and left with a promise that he was going to get a few things from his boat to make us a proper Filipino wedding dinner. Later, as the sky was beginning to darken, we were sitting on the same folding chairs that the ship's captain had thoughtfully brought up from the boat. He also had a small metal framework, a little over four feet long and around two feet wide, cobbled together for cooking over a campfire. Just a series of bars, really, welded together roughly, which now sat over a fire made of local woods and aromatic dry coconut shells. Our bellies were full from the barbecued pork that Felipe had prepared for us, along with green mango which we dipped in salt and vinegar, two handfuls of lanzones, and even a little coconut milk mixed with Bombay sapphire gin, courtesy of Felipe and his handy machete. Our immediate needs satiated, Mindy and I were getting the urge to go back to the hut for another need that was becoming readily apparent in the heady gin haze. The ship's captain, not a man to miss a hint, said he would leave shortly and stay on his boat to give us a little privacy. It would be the last time we saw him alive. We just didn't know it yet. As Mindy and I snuggled together on the bed in our hut, we listened to the hum of some local frogs, which sounded amazingly like electrical transformers powering slowly up and down, coupled with the almost digital sounds of the island's insects. Everything was new and completely surreal. The peace was broken with a sudden cessation of wildlife sounds, replaced by that of groaning wood, Felipe's surprised shouts, and a violent splashing that was quickly replaced with dead silence. What the hell? I said, bolting upright. Mindy and I quickly dressed and ran out into the night. The moon was full, otherwise we wouldn't have been able to see anything. The boat had capsized somehow and was sinking before our eyes. Mindy stopped me before I could run into the open. She motioned me to silence. We were not alone. Four shapes were staggering in, already to the shallows and walking almost mechanically. Two of them were obviously female, carrying wooden debris stacked in their outstretched arms. One of the walkers was smaller than the others. Maybe a male child, but a fat male child at that. He walked with a curious sort of limp and seemed to be carrying two boxes, one rather bulky, and the other some sort of long, thin box with a wide handle. Next to him, a man with spectacles lurched along carrying some sort of handbag of his own. 
We stayed hidden and watched as they came on the beach, stopping as one just a few feet in the dry sand. I now recognized the bulky box which the small one had been carrying as the toolbox that was on the ship. The small one put it down and some seawater sloshed out of it. He gestured toward the direction where we were hiding and said something that we couldn't hear to the other male in the group. The women, strangely, waded back into the sea, coming back with more debris that they piled up in the sand neatly before going back into the waves for more. The men, I could now see that the child was more likely a dwarf-sized man, began building something. Mindy and I were sitting now, huddled together in the darkness and hoping that they didn't see us. We watched. There wasn't much more we could comfortably do, and there was no way we were going back into the hut. We didn't want to risk letting them out of our sights, so we stayed put, hoping secretly that these people would simply leave. As time passed, the women stopped making runs to the now demolished boat and began helping in the construction. They seemed to be building some sort of large table. As best as I could tell, they'd taken Felipe's metal framework and somehow separated it into two parts. The men were very strong, pulling the metal straight between them and then twisting the whole structure to and fro until they were able to separate it into two sections. They attached the framework to two opposite places on the large table, and the women began gathering small pieces of wood and coconut shells, thankfully not straying into the woods where we were hiding. They made small piles of wood underneath the two metal sections of the table, and one of the women's lit it on fire. Taking turns with Felipe's machete, the small man and the large one cut down a number of trees, and the women, impossibly strong as well, uprooted the stumps, ripping them clean from the ground and then arranging them as makeshift chairs around the table. As we were watching this, Mindy and I both realized that we'd lost track of the men. When we looked back, they were simply gone. Dinner time, gargled a voice behind us. Mindy and I both turned and looked around and scooted backwards away in panic. The sight before us was hideous. The dwarf wasn't a dwarf at all. His legs were simply missing. One clipped roughly at just above the knees, while the other had a few inches left below the kneecap. It was obvious why he'd walk the way he did. Wah wah, went his trumpet, like we'd made some sort of mistake in a cartoon. Where he got the breath to blow the amusing notes I couldn't say as parts of his chest seemed to be missing. He had seaweed mixed liberally in his hair, and his face was well pocked in places. Snacks for the fish. His half-goatee was untouched, completing his musician from hell vibe perfectly. Mindy's grip on my arm was like steel, and her speech looping like a broken record. She kept repeating, Jesus, and I could hear the footsteps of the women coming up from behind us. The scent of cigar smoke came with them, but neither I nor Mindy could find it in ourselves to move or look. We were like two deer frozen in bright headlights. Sorry, Doc, the small one said to the other male. You know I can't help myself. Doc sighed. It sounded deep and wet. Just don't miss with the syringe jazz. It's not easy to get refills anymore, and I, for one, would like to be humane about this. Powerful hands clamped onto us from behind as Doc lunged forward, stabbing a full syringe into my arm as the small one, Jazz, hobbled quickly towards Mindy with his own sharp little present. When Mindy and I awoke, we laid on our backs, head to head, on a long table which these people, these obviously dead people had been building. There was a scent in the air, much like pork. Oh god, that's us, I croaked, dizzy and weak. The one called Doc was the first one to speak. You shouldn't feel anything from the fire, he said. 
You're pretty doped up right now. I figured it was the least we could do. Mindy started screaming, thrashing as much as she could on the table. But whatever they shot us up with apparently deadened the muscles quite a bit in the bargain. One of the females with unkept and dirty dark hair waved her cigar at the other woman and said, Will you shut her up, Betts? Betts responded by ripping off a piece of her own blouse and shoving a filthy cloth deep into Mindy's mouth. Let us go. Please, I stuttered before Jazz, balancing oddly on top of his stump chair, reached over and pushed the cloth into my mouth as well. All right, folks, Doc began. You know the rules. You can eat, but don't kill them. They gotta drown or she doesn't get to keep them, he said. You guys get started, said Jazz. I'll play a little music to spice up the meal. It all felt so surreal. The two remaining women and Doc began casually cutting into Mindy and I, sawing off little slabs of our bodies as Doc pointed out sections that he, in his apparently medical wisdom, deemed safe to eat. Mindy wasn't moving. I guess the shock had been too much. And as the blood loss began to get to me as well, the world around me faded gently away, replaced by a slumber that was deep, black, and cold. When Mindy and I awoke, we were floating out with the tide on piles of debris. It was still nighttime as the full and shining moon above us could attest. It hurt everywhere, it was hard to move, and I could see that Mindy was badly cut as well. Patches of flesh were missing from us on various parts of our bodies. Mindy's face was particularly gruesome, as someone apparently decided to sample her cheek. Weak and defeated, Mindy began to weep, and I took her hand, holding it tightly as we bobbed softly on the waves to whatever great beyond awaited us. Broken, but together. Mindy stopped crying and smiled weakly at me. Then there came a change. The waves, light and almost soothing before, suddenly became agitated and the debris which we floated upon was suddenly flipped, violently. Mindy and I fell into the water sinking together, still hand in hand. And then, we woke with a start to the phone ringing in our bungalow. I looked at her. Mindy was white as a sheet, as if we had shared the same dream. Relieved, but still very, very confused, I picked up the phone to answer. Ayo, happy anniversary, said Maria's voice. Maria, uh, what the? I'm sorry, I, I just had the, the strangest dream. It wasn't a dream, she said, and you aren't really in your bungalow. I'm speaking to you this way because it's easier for your mind. The sight of me or even my true voice, well, let's just say that you wouldn't be much use to me if I presented myself this way. As if to punctuate her point, in a flash that must have lasted only milliseconds, I saw a vision of a woman's face. Her hair floating about her, tangled strands of green seaweed and threads of blonde, framing an ivory white face. A perfect oval, with fierce cold blue eyes that seemed to cut and to fill my lungs with water and pressure the longer that I looked at them. I retched for a moment in shock as the world around me flickered back into view. I can hear Maria talking to you. Like, I've got the phone too, said Mindy. She must have been spared the vision. Yes, Mindy, said the voice. Only my name is not Maria. I'm Ron, the goddess of all those who have drowned. You and Jonathan are mine now. Mindy and I looked at each other. I set the phone down. We didn't really need it after all. Remembering something that I read years ago, I asked, Ron, isn't that Norse mythology? What are you doing here in the Philippines? She chuckled at my mind. It was a strange sensation, like a mix of sugar and lemons in my mind after the leaden cold which had come from the nightmare glimpse of her face. What can I say? 
she began. The Norsemen were right. This is not important, however. What is important is this. Know that I expect little enough from you. She paused a moment and continued. You will bring more to me, so that the number of my followers always grows. Once, and only once a year. Call it your anniversary if you'd like. I will let you do as you wish for one day. You can explore the world on your own and even come up again on the land. Mindy and I looked at each other. A spark of hope was kindling. Today is that day, she said. Go out and see for yourselves, and tomorrow you must come back to me. You have much to learn about your new world with us here below. With that, the room began to fade from view replaced by what was now and truly real. The fish had taken a toll on us, but Mindy and I were mostly whole. The undersea, well, it's hard to describe. It's like being outside in the dark, and yet somehow we could still see everything. I think the illumination around us was life, because many of the things that seemed possessed of their own light were swimming all around us, stark contrast with things that seemed to eat all the light around them. Those must be the things that are dead, I thought to myself. Fish were swimming all around, some in schools and others alone, and some of them were quite odd. Some sort of eel, for instance, with a glowing orb that seemed to dangle in front of its hungry serpentine face. The orb produced the light as the thing swam slowly and deliberately to my left, snapping up fish that got too curious about its headlamp. There were other people around as well, some walking on the seafloor, others swimming impossibly fast. Most in tattered clothing, although a few were in better shape than the two of us. Strangest of all were the ships. Watercraft from different eras could be seen drifting or moving quickly in the distance. Everything from wooden ships with triple masts and tattered sails to modern speedboats and heavily damaged yet modern yachts. The world below was just as alive as the one above, it seemed. Well, men, you heard her, I began. It's our day off. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a little peckish. She smiled at me and I could see her teeth through the hole that had been ripped out of her cheek. I'm a lucky man, I tell you. We swam towards the surface and saw a large oval shape above us. Heading towards the island where we said our vows to each other, Mindy smiled at me again, placing one finger to her lips to indicate silence. We swam slowly up to the side of the boat, and both of us pushed together, causing it to jump briefly out of the water as the sail collapsed with a splash onto its side. Mindy was dragging a woman by her long blonde hair, holding her face upright and out of the salt water so that she would not drown before we got her to the island. I was doing the same with a man, but he was unconscious. I'd had to pummel him, or he would have been a pain to drag along. As Mindy and I swam towards the shore, there was a splash behind us, and the sound of a little girl screaming her heart out. We looked back. Felipe was holding a child and grinning. There was no flesh on the right side of his face except for the patch supporting his wispy mustache. I've brought dessert, he said. We laughed and laughed as we swam to shore. That evening we had a fine anniversary dinner and gave three new ones into the service of our goddess. She was well pleased with us. It was a happy anniversary. Indeed.